In this video, I want to return to the concept of non-monophyletic groups. And I want to introduce the concept of plesiomorphies and also the, the concept of convergent evolution and how it relates to non-monophyletic groups. So monophyletic groups, it's always worth repeating, monophyletic groups are clades that are defined by common ancestry. So we have an ancestor and all of its descendants form the, the clade. If we exclude one of these descendants, um, we can end up with a uh, non-monophyletic group. So if we were to attempt to make humans special and to uh, define um, non-human primates or define primates and say humans were not primates, we'd be ignoring the fact that uh, the genetic and morphological evidence indicates that we evolved from a common ancestor. Monophyletic groups, they're defined by common ancestry regardless of the traits um, each taxa happened to uh, evolve. So genetic evidence, morphological evidence indicates that birds and crocodiles are sister taxa. However, birds have traditionally been considered a separate taxa and given special status because they are unique in that these unique features we call them apomorphies and they make them seem separate even though the that even though what's more important evolutionarily are the similarities so birds have feathers birds are warm-blooded birds have uh, hollow bones these make them unique but these are all apomorphies or in particular ought apomorphies characteristics that are unique just to their group and if we focus on these unique features they make us want to isolate birds, but if we start looking at the similarities, other morphological similarities and genetic similarities, they show us that uh, birds are unified with crocodiles and other reptiles. So an ought apomorphy, that's a unique derived character trait, like um, unique to a taxonomic group. So feathers are an ought apomorphy unique to birds. Warm bloodedness is an ought apomorphy uh, unique to birds, hollow bones is an ought uh, apomorphy. That's in contrast to an apomorphy, which is a shared derived characteristic. So scales are in common with snakes, lizards, crocodiles, and birds, and perhaps turtles, though I forget exactly. Uh, birds have scales on their legs, feathers are derived scales. So scales are a apomorphy, a characteristic that emerged um, evolutionarily um, from uh, tetrapod lineages. So tetrapods were back here. Um, some group of tetrapods evolved scales. All of those, that population gave rise to all these other taxonomic groups that share um, the trait scale in one form or another. That is an apomorphia, a shared characteristic. So when we run into trouble with non-monophyletic groups and paraphyletic groups uh, one thing that can happen is that they are being defined by an ancestral state which was replaced in other uh, descendants of their common ancestors so lemur loris and tarsiers are considered or were once considered to be the taxa pro simians and they were in part defined by their lack of color vision they're mostly nocturnal so color vision isn't very helpful so that is one of the similarities that united them monkeys primates humans we all have color vision and so that is a apomorphy a shared derived characteristic that we all share and uh taxonomists set aside, set aside lemurs lorises and tarsiers as separate because they lacked color vision but this ancestral state which is called a plesiomorphy uh Plesiomorphies are not good ways to make uh, to make taxonomic decisions. We want to make taxonomic decisions based on apomorphies versus shared derived characteristics. So color vision, color vision is an apomorphy. It is a shared trait. It was derived from color lack of color vision. Um, primates were lacked color vision. Color vision evolved. This trait is sh derived. Color vision is derived from non-color vision and it is shared by all these other organisms. So color vision is an apomorphy that unites um, this clade here and it is derived from non-color vision and 
we would say that non-color vision, lack of color vision is the plesiomorphic state, the ancient form of the state. And using that plesiomorphic character to form a clade results in a non-monophyletic group. This slide basically says the same thing. Um, the ancestral condition of mammals, uh, ancestral condition of tetrapods was non-color vision. So they retain this characteristic and it artificially creates a taxonomic group that ignores uh, the, the ancestry patterns. The term plesiomorphy, so apomorphy, ought apomorphy, plesiomorphy, I'm not concerned that you memorize them off the top of your head, but you should if, used in a, if they were used in a passage or in a reading section, you should be able to figure out what they are in general. So one way that I remember what plesiomorphies are, and this is not respecting the actual origin of the word, but plesiomorphy has to do with an ancient state, an original state of a trait. Plesiosaurs were ancient sea creatures uh, related to, um, distantly related to uh, reptiles. So plesiosaurs are ancient. They exist in the past. They start with plesio, so plesiomorphy, plesiosaurs helps me to remember that. But plesio doesn't actually mean agent. Uh, I was disappointed when I actually looked that up. So again, an apomorphy is a shared derived characteristic like color vision. It is the opposite of a plesiomorphy. A plesiomorphy is the ancestral character state. So non-color vision, the original state of mammals, that state um, led to the apomorphy of color vision. So color vision was derived from the plesiomorphy of non-color vision. So in a related topic, paraphyletic groups can result from when we focus on ought apomorphies. So birds have evolved to be warm-blooded and also mammals have evolved to be warm blooded. Uh, it says apomorphy here. It should be ought apomorphy to be more clear. Birds as a group are warm blooded. So they have this ought apomorphy as a trait that um, all of them have. But as we've talked about before, ought apomorphies can be somewhat problematic. We don't want to, we don't want to focus on when we compare birds to other large taxa, we don't want to focus on the fact that birds are warm-blooded, because if we did that, we might be tempted to say that mammals and birds were closely related to each other because they share that trait. But this is actually just the case of convergent evolution. Mammals um, evolved from cold-blooded ancestors. They have the ought apomorphy as a group of being warm-blooded. And uh, if we were to say mammals and birds were a taxonomic group, I don't think anyone ever has. But if we were, that would be a paraphyletic group because we would be uniting them by this um, uh, ought apomorphy, uh, this convergent um, characteristic. And we'd be ignoring the fact that their shared common ancestor um, was cold-blooded. We'd be excluding that cold-blooded relative. So phylogenies are all about common ancestry and grouping everyone together that originates from an ancestral node. In this case, mammals and birds both evolved um, to be warm-blooded. This is a case of convergent evolution. They both arrived at that same solution, similar to how birds evolved to fly and some mammals, bats, evolved to fly. Uh, they came up with different ways of achieving it, but that is a convergent solution. So we wouldn't want to group birds and bats together simply because they're warm-blooded and they fly. That would result in a um, paraphyletic group. Um, I believe this... Sh oh, yeah, polyphyletic. I've been, I think I've been saying paraphyletic and polyphyletic wrong here. It's correct on the slides. Again, what's most important is that you recognize them um, as... Uh, non-monophyletic group. If you're not familiar with the uh, terms warm-blooded and cold-blooded, homeothermic and endothermic were on some of the slides, you can refer back to this here.